Good morning, church. If you would open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 75. We'll be continuing our study in the book of Psalms in all the gatherings today. Again, I would encourage you, if you haven't already been doing this, to go back and listen to the other recordings from the other gatherings that you're not attending so that we're benefiting from the full effect of immersing ourselves in this amazing book from God's Word. Psalm 75, I'll begin reading in verse 1. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. Selah. I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with haughty neck. For not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up. But it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. The 16th century Protestant reformer Martin Luther summed up his theology with these words. He said, one must always let God be God. And whether you go in the same direction as Luther goes theologically, I think we could all as Bible-believing Christians agree that that's a good summary of theology. We must let God be God. But that's a classic example of easier said than done, isn't it? Because nobody has trouble letting God be God as long as God does what we would do if we were God. And that's kind of the way it is. But the God that we're talking about, the God of Scripture, the God of Psalm 75, is a God who does some things that are out of step with our cultural preferences. Matter of fact, it's more than out of step. Sometimes they flatly contradict our cultural preferences, our personal preferences. So this God, just to put this all in perspective, this God is a God who defines right and wrong. He defines right and wrong. His, his is not one opinion next to many opinions. We, his opinion is something we call truth. <laughs> he defines right and wrong, and he does it not after having polled our culture or any other culture. He simply defines right and wrong. This God gives us a list of do's and don'ts. Oftentimes we use that phrase, do's and don'ts, to distance ourselves from the notion. But God gives us a list of do's and don'ts, many of which are as binding as they ever were. The God that we read about in Scripture tells us that if we live life on our own and reject Him as the loving Creator and Lord, if we do that, we will be condemned. The God we read about in Scripture doesn't need us. He doesn't have a human-shaped hole in his heart that only you can fill. That's not how God reveals himself in Scripture. He doesn't run a democratic republic, as grateful as we are for ours. He doesn't run a democratic republic. He runs a kingdom. And he is a loving king. He is a compassionate and generous and gracious king. But he's a king. And he shares his throne with no one. This is the only God there is. There are no other deity candidates out there. There are no other God options in the universe. This is the one true living God. He defines himself in this way. And to a culture whose favorite verse is judge not lest you be judged, <laughs> to a culture that stands ready to quote that verse to God himself should he get any ideas, to our culture, to us, God comes in Psalm 75 and he unapologetically asserts his right to judge, his competency to judge, his title as judge. So we want to, we need to think biblically about the judgment of God and Psalm 75 is going to lead us in that. 
this morning, and along the way, we want to stop and just carefully avoid three wrong responses that are tempting and within striking distance of us. We want to avoid three things, and we'll hit them each in their turn. One, we want to steer clear of ridiculing God's judgment. We want to steer clear of boasting in God's judgment, sort of with a smirk on our face. And the third one is we want to steer clear of minimizing God's judgment. Because I hope that we're going to see before we're done that judgment is actually at the very heart of the good news of the Christian faith. There is no gospel without judgment. In a fallen world, there is no salvation without judgment. And that's clear from beginning to the end of the word. And that's why, incidentally, this passage, which is the theme of this passage, is about the judgment of God. That's why this passage, which is about judgment, can begin with a word of thanksgiving. Clearly, something about this judgment must end up being good news for those who trust in this God, who is the way he is. Look at how it begins in verse 1. This is a psalm about judgment. It begins in verse 1 with these words. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. Don't miss where this psalm begins. It's important. It begins with thanksgiving. And here's an underlying truth. The attitude one has toward the judgment of God reveals one's view of the character of God. Let me say that again. The attitude one has toward the judgment of God reveals one's view of the character of God. This psalm begins with God. It begins by urging us, the reader, to consider the source. Before we talk about how or when he judges, let's let's establish that he judges and talk about who it is that is doing the judgment. And the source of judgment in this text, the one doing the judging, is God himself, the Lord God himself. Look at that in verse 2. God is speaking in the first person at this point. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. Look at verse 6. There's source language here. For not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. In other words, Psalm 75 is not a reluctant admission on God's part. It's not him saying, look, I know the cat's out of the bag on this one, so let me just go ahead and admit this. I am the sovereign judge. That's, okay, that's what I do. No, God is not reluctant in that way. This psalm views God's judgment in a positive light, a positive thing. It begins with thanksgiving. Look how it speaks of judgment in verse 3. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keeps steady its pillars. Well, what does that mean? It means that there's some sense in which when God judges the earth, he is stabilizing the earth. Humanism tries to offer us hope that we can establish peace and justice in this world apart from God. And in our time and culture, that hope, in our time and our culture, that hope is often built on some notion of evolution or human development over time, and that's coupled with the importance of education. The only only problem is it's not working. (laughs) Our advances in education are only making the weapons of war more sophisticated. They're not solving the problems of unrest and injustice in our lives, our hearts, in the world, in society. It's not happening. God is the one who establishes order. God alone, according to Psalm 75, is the one who can keep the universe from teetering over into moral disorder. God alone, that's his job. Back here in verse 3, when the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. When we think of divine judgment, we often think of it in terms of God shaking things up. And actually, the scripture sometimes speaks that way in Hebrews chapter 12. God comes in judgment, and everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So it views God's judgment as a shaking up of the earth. But it's interesting, because this psalm comes from the opposite angle. It's using that shaking metaphor, but it's coming at it from from a different way. It's telling us that in one sense, when unrighteousness and evil and injustice are left unchecked in the earth, the moral 
fabric is coming apart. The moral order of the universe is teetering. It's tottering there. And when God steps in in judgment, he is steadying the world, steadying the universe. One of the reasons I think people in our culture, people even in Scripture, find God's judgment perturbing, concerning, is because we don't begin where the psalm begins. We don't begin with a view of the biblical God, who he is, what he's like. And so you hear boasting throughout the word. Even here in the psalms, we can see things like this. In Psalm 94, Note the view of God on the part of the wicked. O Lord, Psalm 94, verse 3 through 9, it says, O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exalt? They pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. And they say, so here's the theology of a godless world. Here's what they say. The Lord does not see. And the God of Jacob does not perceive. And the psalm goes on to say, understand, O dullest of the people, fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? So Psalm 75, it views judgment in a positive light because it views God in a positive light, which is to say again that our view of judgment takes its cue from our view of God. It dances in step with our view of God. What does that mean practically? As we're reading through the Bible, it means if I trust God's character, I'm convinced he will judge rightly. So before we read that difficult chapter where God comes in judgment, we're convinced that God is good. And after we read that difficult chapter on the judgment of God, we're convinced that God is good. We're not questioning the righteous character of God because we're going to the source at the beginning and we're asking the question, okay, who's the one doing the judging? I know it's a difficult chapter. Who's the one doing the judging? Oh, it's God. Oh, what else do we know about God in his self-revealing word? One, we know he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is not a God who's trigger happy. He's not giddy, blasting people from the skies. That's not this God. We know, too, he is righteous in all his ways, the scripture says. All, not some of his ways. He's righteous in all of his ways. He doesn't have temper tantrums. He doesn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed. His judgment is an expression of his righteous character. He can't do anything but be righteous. Third, Proverbs 3.19 tells us the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. He didn't just found the earth by wisdom. He runs it by wisdom. He judges the earth with wisdom. Wisdom, and we often see wisdom and God's judgment coupled together. For, for example, in, in Romans chapter 11, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom, there it is, rich, riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. Judgments, wisdom, they, they stand in lockstep together in God, his character. That's who he is. So this God, it's this God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, righteous in all of his ways, all wise, that's the one who's the judge of all the earth. And that's why this psalm can speak of judgment the way that it does, by beginning and saying, we give thanks to you, O God. We recount your wondrous deeds. That doesn't mean, though, that there won't be mystery. It doesn't mean we're always gonna understand the connection between the wisdom and righteousness of God and the judgment that we find in that next chapter of the Bible that we find ourselves reading. We may not fully understand the why and the how of God's judgment, but faith in God means we come to these passages with a humble trust and confidence that God is right, that God is good. And this brings us to the first wrong response to the biblical teaching about God's judgment. And the first way that we don't want to respond is we don't want to ridicule 
God's judgment. So outspoken critics like Bill Maher, as if there's another kind of critic, um, speak of God's judgment in, in this kind of flippant way. He sums up the story of Noah and the great flood with these words. The story of Noah is about a psychotic mass murderer who gets away with it, and his name is God. There's an underlying assumption in that. Not just that statement from Bill Maher, but sometimes the way that we can think about God when we read about his judgment. And and it's this. We have this habit of assuming that our sense of fairness and justice is the standard of fairness and justice. But when we speak like this, we give the impression that there is some moral code that exists outside of God, if you will, above God, And God himself is answerable to that moral code of what's right and what's wrong. And God is only righteous insofar as he conforms to that moral standard, which just so happens to perfectly match my sense of what's right and what's wrong. Do you see this? Right? I mean, I know this might look like a conflict conflict of interest, but this is just what would have been right for God to do. I mean, based on what I know. This is arrogance. This is pride. This is ridiculing God's judgment. This is standing in judgment over God himself. There was a, a few years ago, there was a debate tour between atheist Christopher Hitchens and author and theologian Douglas Wilson. And they traveled around, they set up in auditoriums and school auditoriums and diners and pubs throughout the states. And they had vigorous conversation about the question of, is Christianity good for the world? And at one point in that debate, Christopher Hitchens, the atheist, brought up 1 Samuel 15 and the slaughter of the Amalekites. And Douglas Wilson said, I think it was okay for God to order the destruction of the Amalekites. And Hitchens quickly interrupted him. He said, there, I got you to say it. And Wilson said, you didn't get me to say anything. I'm happy to say it. He didn't mean I'm happy, I'm giddy about God's judgment. He simply meant I'm not embarrassed of God. Who am I to stand in judgment? If God ordered the destruction of the Amalekites, he is righteous. And he goes on later on in the debate to say, this may come as a surprise, but Christians believe the Bible. That fundamental foundation of trust that God is righteous. He's good. There's no other possibility. This is our foundation, our presupposition. We don't call into question the God who is. We trust him. And one of the reasons I think our culture is so allergic to biblical teaching about the judgment of God is because it reminds us of something that we hate hearing in our pride. God is above us. He's flat out above us. I'm not God's accountability partner. I mean, he's not asking me He's not asking you or anyone else if it's going to be all right for him to flood the earth in Genesis 6. Is it heavy-handed, Matt? Mortal Matt? Is it heavy-handed for me to order the destruction of the Amalekites? He's not asking me that question. That's above my pay grade, right? I'm not able to weigh in on that discussion. God knows. He's all wise. And we're allergic, aren't we? We're allergic to hierarchy. I mean, unless we're on top. That's the irony. We're allergic to hierarchy unless we're on top. And that's not just a modern thing, a 21st century thing. It's not just an American thing. It's a fallen humanity thing. Isaiah 29, Romans chapter 9 make this abundantly clear. Isaiah 29, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he says, you turn things upside down, Israel. You turn it upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? That the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me. Or the thing formed, say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. The ridicule response is arrogant and it's proud and it's wrong because it operates on the assumption that we have a better sense of right and wrong than God does. This response is not just so self-righteous as to look down its nose at other sinners. It takes self-righteousness to new levels. It looks down its nose at God himself. Friends, this is not an appropriate response. That is arrogant and prideful. The God of the Bible 
We have to be convinced of this. The God of the Bible is who he is. He is not changeable, malleable at the hands of our culture. He, and he can't be taken in a piecemeal kind of way. It's not like we have these options coming down where, like when you're buying a computer and you can choose or select or deselect which soft, software you want installed on the, on the system. That's not how God is. We can't take him in a piecemeal kind of way. He is this way, and it's a package deal. He is creator, lawgiver, judge, savior, comforter, returning king. He's all of those, and it's an all or nothing prospect. You take him as he is for your eternal joy, or you reject him as he is for your eternal destruction. And we don't say that with a smirk on our face. We say it because it's the truth from God's word. And we plead with those who won't hear it, and we say, please submit to this God for your eternal joy. This is who God is. And really, in a way, the doctrine of God's judgment draws a line in the sand between those who take God as he reveals himself in his word and those who pick what they like and leave aside the rest. Augustine said, you who believe what you want of the gospels and disbelieve what you want, believe yourselves rather than the gospels. How true this is of the word. You believe what you want about the word and disbelieve what you want, believe yourself and not the word. One author put it this way, but far from owning that this culture hates God, the vast majority of men will not only strongly deny it, but affirm that they respect and love him. Yet if their supposed love is analyzed, it is found to cover only their own interests. While a man concludes that God is favorable and lenient with him, he entertains no hard thoughts against him. So long as he considers God to be prospering him, he carries no grudge against him. He hates God, get this, he hates God not as one who confers benefits. Who hates a God who confers benefits? He's giving stuff? Great, awesome, I'll take him. He doesn't hate God as one who confers benefits, but as a sovereign, lawgiver, judge. He will not yield to his government or take his law as the rule of his life. The only God, he goes on to say, against whom the natural man is not at enmity is one of his own imagination. God is not ashamed of his title as the judge of all the earth. It's the first thing out of his holy mouth when he speaks in the first person in verse two. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. This is the source of judgment. The next thing that comes up in our passage is the target of judgment, namely the proud. Follow along with me. Verse four, I say to the boastful, do not boast, and to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with haughty neck, for not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. From beginning to end, this is how God comes in judgment. From the beginning where proud Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven to Adam and Eve in the garden, eating the fruit so that they would be like God to Pharaoh arrogantly refusing to let God's people go all the way to the end of time in Revelation 18 and the downfall, the throwing down of luxurious great Babylon. The whole Bible presents this picture that God's judgment always hits its target and it targets human pride always hits its target, and it targets pride. You know, there are these moments when as you read through the Bible, it's sort of like your hair stands up on edge, and you think, he shouldn't have said that. He should not have said that. That is not going to bode well for him moments from now. That happens in Daniel 5 is one example. So background of Daniel 5, God's people are in exile. Jerusalem's been torched. And Belshazzar is the then ruler of Babylon, and he's throwing a big party and the theme of the party is, you know, Babylon is bigger, badder, and richer than everybody else. And since I'm ruler of Babylon, it's kind of like an, um, you know, look how awesome I am kind of party. And so this is, this is what Belshazzar is doing. And then he does something in, in this moment in Daniel chapter 5 that is really dumb. He, he orders his subjects to 
Go and get the gold and silver vessels. Remember the ones that we stole from the temple of Jerusalem before we burned it to the ground? Yeah, go get those vessels. Bring them in. We'll drink from the holy vessels to celebrate the glory and dominion of Babylon. So a round of drinks for all my lords, my wives, and my concubines. Drink to the glory of Babylon with the vessels of God's holy temple. And the text says, as they drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall, and the king saw it. Goes on to say, the king's color changed. You bet it did. The king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. And when this ruler of the empire, the great empire of Babylon, is addressed by the sovereign God and judge of all the earth through Daniel. Here's what it says. Daniel 5, 18 through 23. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father, your predecessor, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar. And because of the greatness that God gave him, all peoples, nations, and language Languages trembled and feared before him. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he, he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. Doesn't that sound like verse 7 from Psalm 75? It is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. He goes on to say, and he's speaking to Belshazzar, and you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven and the vessels of his house, my house, God is saying, have been brought in before you and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood and stone which do not see or hear or know but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored you go and you read through the end of chapter 5 and you find out that God puts an end to this party and to the kingdom of Babylon that very night. In come the Medo-Persians. In comes Darius. And they begin their rule. God's judgment always hits its target and it targets human pride. This is not only true when it comes to pagan pride, but this should sober us because it's it's also true when it comes to religious pride. So both James and Peter in the New Testament remind believers, remind believers, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And this really brings us to another wrong response to biblical teaching about God's judgment, and that wrong response is to boast in judgment. And some of us, we can read passages that speak of God's judgment of evil and assume an attitude of moral superiority. You remember the Pharisee's prayer in Luke chapter 18 where he lifted up his voice, it says in Luke 18, he lifted up his voice and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like that guy over there. Right, this is what we've come to call in modern culture the humble brag because this prayer is basically saying, I'm better than you, but it's only because of grace. And God will have none of this. You, you look at Jesus in the Gospels, you find the places where he's shouting, where he's rebuking, where he's condemning, and invariably he's talking to not the Belshazzars of the world. He's not talking to the atheists and the idol worshipers. He's talking to professing members of the community of faith. He's talking to churchgoers. He's talking to Sunday school teachers. That's who he's talking to, leaders in the religious community of Israel, and he reserves his strongest language for them. You brood of vipers, you blind leading the blind, you whitewashed tombs. When we watch Jesus' manner with the self-righteous religious in the Gospels, we are seeing in living color God opposing the proud. He says, Jesus says, if you knew you were blind, I would heal you. But because you think you see, your blindness remains. He says, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
that wasn't a compliment. He wasn't saying, you guys are good. I'm going to get those losers. He was passing them up in judgment. He was passing them up in judgment. He was opposing the proud. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, said, the greatest of all disorders is to think we are whole and need no help. The greatest of all disorders is to think we are whole and need no help. You know, we read through the book of Proverbs not long from now. You read through the book of Proverbs and we come to this moment that kind of brings us to the edge of our seats because the sentence starts this way. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. And guess what leads the list of things God hates? Haughty eyes. He hates pride. Same thing in our text here. Verse five, do not lift up your horn on high or speak with haughty neck. May God convict us of our haughty eyes. And this boasting response is arrogant because it assumes that when God comes in judgment of evil and injustice in the world, I'll be safe because I'm so righteous. But no, when the Bible speaks about the problem of evil in the world, when it speaks about injustice and vengeance and jealousy and anger and malice and lust and greed and selfishness, we discover that we're inside the problem of evil, not outside it. We're inside the situation of evil. The scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It goes on to say, the wages of sin is death. It says in Romans 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who seeks God. There is no one who understands. Boasting is arrogant and it's out of place in light of our corruption, in light of indwelling sin. Someone said that pride is the AIDS of the soul. It's said that no one dies of AIDS. But AIDS breaks down your body's defenses against all manner of other illnesses that may eventually kill you. And pride does that. It kills your spiritual immunity system, so to speak, so that you can be taken down by any number of sins. It makes us think we're above temptation. All others might turn away from you, but not me. Remember that? Peter's words to Jesus, famous last words. Check them out tomorrow. Pride goes before a fall. Apostle Paul had a friend named Demas. Demas joined him on missions trips. Demas gets a shout out in Colossians and in Philemon where Paul is saying, hey, Demas is right here with me. He greets you guys. We're on mission together. He mentions Demas in a couple of different places in the New Testament. These were gospel comrades. These were fugitives on the run. They were going into towns. They were proclaiming good news. They were getting beat up and run out of town together. They were taking selfies at the edge of that city. This is, this is Paul's boy. This is one of his friends, his close comrades in the proclamation of the gospel. And then Paul, in his last letter before he dies, he writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, and he says, Timothy, you're not gonna believe this. Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. Demas is gone. Demas has defected from the faith because he fell in love with this world. Sobering. Pride left unchecked, friends, will take us to places we never thought we'd go. Never thought we'd go. It'll take us into lust, the foothills of lust, and then it'll take us deeper and deeper into all forms of sexual immorality or adultery. It will do that. It will lead us to bitterness and isolation so that we close off our lives from other people and living sacrificially in love toward others because they're not giving us what we need. Pride will lead us to think that way. It'll lead us to divisiveness in the church. I was reading a book this week by Francis Schaeffer called The Mark of the Christian. The premise of the book is based on John 13 and John 17. Two verses, John 13, 35. By this all people will know that you are my disciples. By this. This is the apologetic. This is the indicator that you're true, truly my disciples. If you have love for one another. John 17, Jesus prays that the church may be one so that the world may believe that the Father sent the Son. 
And Schaefer's premise is basically this. Jesus is giving a right to the world. He gives the world the right to judge if we're true disciples. He gives the world the right to judge if the Father has truly sent the Son. And they get the right to judge that on the basis of whether they see us loving one another. There are moments where I kind of wish God hadn't done that. Because in so many ways, we as members of the church of Jesus Christ, this is bigger than Brook Hills, the church of Jesus Christ, we're not necessarily overwhelming the world with evidence that any of this stuff is true. Pride is killing our witness. We're gonna talk about one of the next services, Psalm 78, discipling the next generation. Pride will lead us to disciple our children to be just little Pharisees with their modern phylacteries and their external outward rites, religious exercises, but they're not amazed by grace. And they've never wept over the fact that though their sins were as scarlet, they have been washed white as snow. What a tragic miss. What a tragic miss when we look at judgment and we boast in it. We get smirks on our faces. We look at biblical judgment and all it produces is, thank you, God, that I'm not messed up like all those other people are. Thank you that I'm not messed up like those unbelievers over there with no moral compass, no sense of right and wrong. Thank you that I'm not like those people who worship with all the moving lights or those people over here who worship with the pre-written prayers and the pipe organs. Thank you that I'm not like them. Adventures in missing the point. Where is my heart? Why am I smirking? This boasting is not good. You know, Paul diagnoses the issue of why so many of his kinsmen, his brothers and sisters in Israel, rejected the Messiah. And he says it was essentially a pride issue. Romans chapter 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. There's plenty of that, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. In this case, the rejection of Israel on the part of embracing the Messiah wasn't because they wanted to eat, drink, and be merry with the dying pagan world around them. They rejected God's salvation because they were so righteous. They looked in the moral mirror and liked what they saw. They were blind to the reality that they needed a righteousness that was outside of them and they couldn't just obtain this by their own works. They said, we don't need a handout. We are not God's charity case. This is what Israel said and in it rejected the Messiah, rejected God's way of salvation. No wonder Jesus begins the Beatitudes, this list of things that we're supposed to seek. He begins this just by saying, hold on, listen to this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God has a predictable pattern. God exalts the lowly, and he brings down the proud. In scripture, blessing comes to those who are poor in spirit. The meek inherit the earth. Battles are not won by trusting in horses, chariots, the strength of man, the weapons of man, but by trusting in God. Scripture says, through our God we shall do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our foes. There's this fundamental humble trust in the power of God. Oh, to be a church full of people who are poor in spirit. Oh, is that our desire? Oh, to be a man, a husband, a father, a pastor who is poor in spirit. Jonathan Edwards is well known for his resolute attentiveness to living a godly life. Every moment of his existence, every word that he said, every thought that he thought, he wanted to live for the glory of God in every moment of his life, and yet years after his conversion, he said this, I've had a vastly greater sense of my own wickedness and the badness of my heart than ever I had before my conversion. Is that your experience? You know, in scripture, the closer holy people got to the holy God, the less holy they saw themselves to be. Is that our experience? 
Charles Spurgeon said, it's easier to save us from our sins than from our righteousness. Friends, don't miss who's in the crosshairs of judgment in Psalm 75. It's the proud. So there can be no more important response for us to this truth than to humble ourselves before this God, to cast ourselves, oh, may we do this, cast ourselves on his mercy because if we don't think we need mercy, we need it more than ever. Oh, let us not be proud. The source of judgment is the Lord God. The target of judgment is the proud. And finally, the goal of judgment is salvation. Verses eight through 10. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. God's judgment is a terrifying thing because God is infinitely holy and we have sinned against him. And the sobering thing that we find out here is that God's judgment at the end of the day will not be poured out sparingly. It will be poured out in full. There is a cup in verse eight that's filled all the way to the brim with God's judgment against human sin. And that cup, it says, will be drained down to the dregs. On the last day, the cup will be turned over and there will be no drippage. God's wrath will have been fully poured out on all evil and no one will be able to charge God with overreacting to evil. Psalm 51, which we looked at just a couple of weeks ago in verse four, it says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. If there's a sense in which those words could be written as a fitting response to every act of judgment in the Bible. What happened in the great flood? Here's what happened. Against you and you only did they sin and did what was evil in your sight so that you were justified in your words and blameless in this flood. You are not a psychotic mass murderer who got away with it. You are the judge of all the earth and you have done what is right. The slaughter of the Amalekites You are justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. The earth opens up and consumes the sons of Korah. Fiery serpents are sent out into the camp of Israel. You are just in your words and blameless in your judgment all the way down to the day of judgment where God's wrath is poured out against all rebellion. As a matter of fact, in one sense, it could be written over the door of hell itself against you. You only have these sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your words and blameless in this eternal judgment. That is what our sins deserve. The scripture points out time and time again that we should never play the justice card with God. That's not a good day. We should never say, God, you're not giving me what I deserve. That's not a good day. Psalm 130, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is supposed to be obvious. No one could stand if God were marking our iniquities against us. Psalm 76, seven, but you are to be feared. Who can stand before you when once your anger is roused? Answer, no sinner can. And we have all sinned against this holy God. There's none righteous, no, not one. So how is it that we can say the goal of judgment is salvation? How is it possible for us, far from ridiculing judgment, far from boasting and having a smirk on our face, far from that, to humbly give thanks for God in the midst of a song about his judgment? And the answer to that has everything to do with the cup in verse eight and a prayer from the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember that? Jesus knelt down in Gethsemane and he said, Father, if it's possible, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but yours be done. And the Father's silence in the face of Jesus' plea for this cup to pass tells us that it was not the will of God for this cup to pass from Jesus. What was the Father's will in sending the Son you know, this foaming cup of justice sat there for thousands of years as nations and Israel all 
sinned grievously before God. God could not simply take this cup and just pour it out on the ground, as it were. That would be to deny his character. It would be to deny his commitment to justice, and God cannot deny himself. So the cup has got to be drunk. And in the fullness of time, God sends his son to come and give his life as a ransom for sinners. Isaiah said that the Lord would lay upon him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. The next time, friends, we see this foaming cup from Psalm 75, the next time we see it is on a hill outside Jerusalem on the darkest day in history. God the Father puts it into the hand of his son and says, drink it. That's your salvation. That's the glory of the cross. That's the glory of the mercy of God. Jesus took the cup and drained it for all who believe. This is the gospel. No wonder there's salvation in no one else. No wonder it's such an insult to speak of other ways of salvation. When he alone, the son himself, became the substitute For sinners, he alone, Scripture says, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The judgment of God on Jesus is our only hope of rescue. R.C. Sproul says, the one from whom we need to be saved is the one who has saved us. So the final response that we want to avoid is minimizing judgment. We don't want to minimize judgment. The minimizing response is also arrogant because if God in his word makes judgment a prominent theme, then when I push this aside, no matter how humble I look or sound when I'm doing it, I have assumed the position of being God's editor, being God's PR agent. But read the word. If if God's primary goal was to be accepted by our culture, he really should have given us a different book a much shorter one because so much of what's here is hated by our culture. But more than that, we want to avoid minimizing judgment because when we downplay the judgment of God, we are stealing glory from the cross. When we look at the cross, we see the greatest expressions of God's justice and mercy in all of history. God's justice, look at the cross, God's judgment, ju- justice is glorified in that moment like no other moment because the cup of wrath is being drained to the dregs. Justice is seen, but God's mercy is equally glorious in that moment because it's being drained by the Son, not by me. He is drinking my cup. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he's drinking your cup on the cross so that there's no wrath left for you. This is the mercy of God. The apostle Paul says, you want to boast. I'll tell you what to boast in. Boast in that. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the cross, we see that God, according to Romans, is both just and and the justifier of the one who believes in Christ. God is the judge of the earth and he is the lover of our souls. We see both simultaneously in the cross. But we we must respond to this good news. Jesus isn't automatically the savior of everyone in the world. It's not as though, hey, because Jesus drained the cup, there's salvation for the whole world, otherwise we'd be universalist. There is some application, there is some response that gets us in on the good of this gospel. This is why response is utterly vital. At the end of the day, all of God's judgment against sin will have been poured out. Either Jesus Christ drinks the cup of God's judgment in your place because God is merciful, or you'll have to drink it yourself because God is just. No wrath will be left. It will all be drained and the one who turns from sin and trusts in Jesus will never drink a single drop of God's just wrath. Why? Because Jesus stood in our place and drank it for all who trust in him. And God is just, which means that he can't let Jesus pay the full bill and leave some for you. That would be unjust. 
The wrath has been satisfied. This is why I love the verse of it is well so much. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. That's why Romans 8 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not that condemnation was swept under the rug, so that's good news. It's that the condemnation was absorbed by Jesus. This is good news. When we look at the cross, we see God's judgment, accomplishing God's salvation for all who believe. If you are here and you've never trusted in Jesus and turned from your sin, I would urge you and plead with you to run to the Savior of the world. This one who is the judge offers salvation to all who believe. Put your hope and your trust in the only one who can save and the only one who can rescue us from what we deserve at the hands of a holy God. If it was appropriate for the psalmist to begin a psalm of judgment with a word of thanksgiving, how much more so for us? We can say with even more heartfelt conviction, Psalm 75, we give thanks to you, O God. (laughs) We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds and his most wondrous deed of all is that the Father found a way in his wisdom to be at the same time the judge of all the earth and the savior of the world. What amazing news this is.